everyone this is Harshmeen today and I am sitting here with one of the biggest person we know in New Zealand his name is Robert Hollis and he has a lot of businesses around New Zealand and currently he is in US stuck because of COVID and but I was very lucky enough to get him for an interview to show you what he does and how he does and how he end up uh, doing everything by himself and all his team so here we go Robert how are you today very good appreciate the time it's good to reconnect again same here and uh, it's a pleasure to meet you again and obviously not in person but through zoom as well we live in a digital world people forget all the time but still uh, very uh, excited to meet you i no, just appreciate it it's uh, yeah good to the, the digital spaces um i think everyone's kind of used to zoom calls and stuff now but um one thing which has been good is the ability to connect way faster with a whole bunch of people that she wouldn't usually be able to so it's um yeah tech for good in many ways that's true uh first of all i would like to have an introduction who is robert hollis Uh, in the simplest form, maybe hood kid done good. <laughs> um, probably a start point, but you know, I, I was a, a ex professional snowboarder, transitioned to business, um, media into tech stuff, and now and fingers in a whole bunch of pies. So I don't think the journey is uh, ended by any means. I think I'm probably just only getting started. You know, I'm 36 years old now, but you know, I've been fortunate enough to do some cool stuff in the past and then I hope to do many more cool stuff in the future. But um, who am I? Probably just a insanely driven, over-determined um, over underdog who failed high school and has continued to do his own thing his own way. So in many ways, that's, um, that's probably me in a nutshell. Mm. Underdog. Yeah, and uh, I would just like to uh, say that that I met you at the soda uh, do, and I didn't have the money to pay for the ticket so I volunteered there and listening to you about your story, how your father passed away and you were the big, you know, the eldest one and look after the family and all of those stuff led you to do all of this. Can I hear that story again for the people who are saying we can't do this because we don't have that, we don't have this? Yeah, for sure. So in a nutshell, I'd, um, my whanau is from Ngāti Pro, uh, East Coast Gisborne. I grew up on a farm in Dargaville, up north until I was four, Fiji until I was eight, and then uh, Aranui Christchurch. Uh, when I was 11 years old, my dad had a double brain hemorrhage and went back to the brain capacity of a six-year-old. So, you know, essentially at 11 years old, I was the man of the house. Um, at 15 years old, um, my dad passed away in a car crash. We were on, a, on New Year's Eve. We were heading up north uh, on a family vacation, and it was kind of anything but. So that was the, sec the second kind of key thing. And then the, the third part was um, my careers advisor told me that I could uh, work in a warehouse packing boxes after when I grew up. And for me, that was sort of um, a whole bunch of fuel, which I used to basically say, stuff you. I'm just going to go and do a whole bunch of bigger and better shit and I um, just use that as motivation and that's kind of what got me out so I'd never um, you know everyone's always sort of told me no and everyone's always sort of you know I guess doubted you know either you know because I, I wasn't good at school I failed high school I couldn't get into university it, you know had no degrees qualifications nothing I kind of didn't really have any you know I, I had my time my skill set and my drive and I just kind of focused my energy and effort to where I wanted to go and I just went to town with it. So, you know, anytime someone tells me they can't do something, um, I instantly put them in a position of weakness because they're using an excuse as their scapegoat for them, not them to be able to create or do or go or create. Because if you look at anyone who does anything that's of significance, it's, um, it's never because someone gave it to them. It's always because they had to go and create something themselves or push something themselves or get something themselves or do something with others to go and get it. You know, it's never, um, you know, winners are never on defense. You have to go on offense to create or go and move. And so I think I've just been consistently on offense for a very long time now. And I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. 
and uh, what kind of businesses do you have now um, I remember I came to your building in Oakland to meet you and honestly that was the best you know being a international student and meeting the one of the biggest uh, you know uh, millionaires in New Zealand it was biggest achievement for me I would say can you tell me what kind of businesses do you have now Yes, yeah, so I had come up to the media and tech space. So I had a, a content, a video production media agency. Um, so we would do all the sort of digital content stuff. So I was very um, heavily involved in the video production, content creation, creative side of, of the ecosystem. So we would do digital content for, you know, like the ASBs, BMWs, Range Rovers, Verve Clicos, Coronas of the World, Heinekens of the World. Um, which was which was super cool, um, and then I um, exited that company and got acquired by Saatchi and Saatchi in 2018, mm -hmm. um, and then I built out a network of uh, yeah co-working shared workspaces for tech startups, and so essentially a commercial real estate play, and then also exited out of that a couple of years ago as well. And for the last couple of years, I've kind of been on um, a bit of daddy daycare. I've got two daughters now, um, three, so I've got two, which is kind of um, and add a pandemic on top of that, which is sort of a crazy. Um, other thing and so I've kind of been a super present there for the last couple of years which has been really cool and then literally just next week for the first time in a very long time I'm starting to travel again um, so yeah so that's kind of where I've come from and then where I'm at now um, I've got my fingers in a few pies I'm starting to look at different um, sort of investments into growing New Zealand businesses to help them grow on scales other potential advisory and board roles a little bit of keynote speaking but I'm thinking with where I want to get to, obviously I do fun stuff and media and all that, but that, that, that doesn't really count. Um, but for me, a key next piece is how do you, how do I start to get deeper into the world of, I guess, investing in advising, building a portfolio, potentially launching a fund, you know, just kind of bigger shit. Um, and that's kind of where, and I'm very new to that space mm -hmm. at, that, at a high enough level. So um, I've got a couple of pretty um, awesome partners who I'm starting to, to work with on some of the Power Moves crew. So um, I would like to learn more about that. Well, that's kind of probably where I'm going to uh, head to next. And yeah, I'll still do, you know, different ventures and fun stuff along the way. But um, yeah, just trying to get to, I guess, you know, a, a bigger bigger game when it comes to business, either buying, selling, merging, listing, public, whatever it is with different bigger, big companies. Um, I think I'd like to start learning more in, in that space. Um, when you were starting your business, right, we were not in that technolo technology space that, uh, you know, we were not that much, uh, you know, search Google and everything you can learn from straight away. How did you manage to learn all those skills and come into this kind of space now like you that you don't have to worry about how if you're even taking care of your kids you don't have to work too much obviously you still work yeah yeah no for sure i mean i love i love what i do i get up um i, I get excited to to um to connect up and see what's bubbling and what i can create i think the big, big thing for me is momentum like i need to be feeling like i'm progressing whether it be like mentally or you know, emotionally, physically, whatever. I feel like I need to be be moving. If I get stagnant and stop, I feel that that will um, that will kill me in many, in many ways. Um, but in terms of the skill sets that I sort of started with, you know, in New Zealand, you've in many parts of the world, you need to be an expert in one specific niche and mm -hmm. go deep on that. In New Zealand, the majority of people that run small businesses, they need to be able to do everything. You know, they need to run their brand, run their social, run their payroll, run their business, run their operations, supply, logistics, manufacturing, like everything. They need to be slashies. They need to be like director slash producer slash whatever. And in the media world, it was always that, you know, you were a slashy, you were, a, you know, a producer slash editor slash filmer slash photographer slash copywriter slash graphic designer slash everything, right? Like, like. I've always had to, anything that I've created, I, at some point I've had to be able to touch every different part of it. So from day one when I was super young, I learned to, you know, extremely badly, but, you know, code, program, design, write, whatever. Like, and it got to a point I remember when I was in the snowboard world, I was snowboarding um, and I was covering this contest that I also entered. So then I remember I had to like take photos of the comp, write about the competition, take some video into the competition. I won the competition, then I had to write about myself 
and I'd won it when I was doing it, and it was just a super weird thing. But you had to kind of do everything, right? Um, and then eventually uh, would own those platforms. So uh, to answer the question, um, I I had always been a practitioner and done the work. I had always like I know how to do the things which need to be done. Now I'm bad at it, but I know how to do it, and it gives you a lot more um, context for, and perspective for when you want to different, make different plays. You have a bit of a, more of an understanding of what type of things you need to go and build. So I was just extremely fortunate that at a young, in my earlier years, I could, I had to physically do everything. So I understood what needed to be done instead of um, having no clue and then getting steamrolled. So I was able to be, I was able to create a lot with a little just because of my time and my, I, would, I would commit and go and do. And it's probably one of the biggest things that I would say to other crew is, you know, when you get your hands dirty, go create, figure it all out, deep, deep, understand it, because then it gives you a lot more um, leverage down the line. And uh, while you are in US, who's managing your business in New Zealand? So I've got a pretty small team. Well, I, after I exited both my companies, I had I didn't really have much actually because I had the ventures, but then I'd obviously exited the ventures um, and then doing the family thing. So I haven't had to, I guess, physically be anywhere for a couple of years now. I haven't had to do, um, like I don't have a nine to five. I don't need to sit in a cubicle. I don't need to um, sit in traffic. I don't, I don't need to do any of that. Um, so I, it's been, you know, wake up, hang out with my kids, um, then, uh, I will come do a bit of work in the middle of the day, hang out with my kids, they go to bed and I do another little bit of work at night. So I've kind of got this sort of, just my priorities have sort of shifted, but I've got, um, you know, one of my companies back home, um, you know, got a general manager staff that runs it. I've still got my 2IC slash EA, I've got a design team, I've got a tech and, you know, digital experience crew. I've got, you know, like I've got the, I've got the crew that I need. I've got my advisors, I've got my network of people that I need to do. Um, and so I think that's quite a secondary bit, you know, I've touched foot in New Zealand since COVID started and yet I've, you know, started, built, done stuff physically mm -hmm. without me even there. And I haven't actually seen it, but I've, I've built it and done it. I just um, haven't been there. So that's why the, 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 the joy of having a good team um, is one of the things that, you know, you can't scale greatness alone. So if you want to build something, you need to do it with, with others and, and pick them good. And I've done overall a pretty average job with my hiring because i'm just so optimistic and awesome like whoever just walks in the door i'm like yeah awesome let's do it yep me next because i'm already on to the next 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 thing and then what usually happens um you know and so now i've basically uh, been given the a bit of a red light so anytime i need to hire someone they need to go through other processes and other people and all the rest of it because i'm, I'm not the, the greatest in terms of um in terms of hr or hiring because i'm just you know i don't manage i just create do it do and go i just i just go for it so i kind of will set up a framework of like hey team this is what we're going and we just we all go to town and so um yeah that's that's how that works so having a tight team that you trust close and then having um sort of systems and processes in place to help try and navigate around that now i'm not perfect at it but i think i'm doing a lot better because i mean shit i'm half around the world and i've got things that are still working so that's pretty awesome yeah and uh, what did you what happened during covid did you lose lose money or how did you manage your work during that time and sec and secondly um uh what was one thing you learned during covid yeah so to the um when the events and hospitality industry and everything went to zero i was stupid enough to then launch something in that space um and it was kind of crazy because it may, in many ways it maybe worked out because when everyone, I, I kind of like the idea when everyone does this, I just do that. And so I did that last year um, and it's hopefully working out okay now. Um, but um, yeah, the, what was the second part? You said that. The, uh, what did, you, of, what did you learn from COVID during COVID uh, in terms of business and life? Yeah. Yeah, so to that point, which actually um, segue from it, is the biggest thing I've realized is that I would always, I would always physically, I would always think that if I physically wasn't in the room back in New Zealand, I added no value and I was a zero because I wasn't there. Do you know what I mean? Like I wasn't physically in the room, so I, I didn't matter. And what I realized is after everything went to lockdown, I was half around the world 
and then I woke up one day and I, I was like, wait a second, everyone in New Zealand right now is locked in their house, they've got a room, they've got a chair, they've got a desk, they've got a laptop, they've got an internet connection. And I'm halfway around the world and I've got a laptop and a, and a, and a computer and, a, and, and Wi-Fi. So what's the difference between me and them if we all need to do business right now? And I was like, actually, the biggest liability of me physically not being in the room became my biggest asset because then I realized if everyone's got to play my game now, I know how to play this game very well because I've done it for years. And it became this switch in my head where I just realized, holy shit, I think I can, if everyone's doing this right now and they've got to play my game and figure out how my world works, I'm already 20 years ahead because I've been living out of a suitcase for 20, 20 years with, with a laptop just working and doing everything as I've gone anyway. So that was a huge moment for me which made me realize that um, there is no reason that you can't um, execute, create, build, start, sale, invest, whatever it is, um, all remotely without even physically being there. So now the bit that I miss, uh, obviously, you know, the FaceTime, my friends, the people, the relationships, all the rest of it, but um, I've still been able to build, start, grow, and do business things which are winning without me even there. And I think that is cool. Now, um, so, you know, on paper, it works. Now, just um, more in person, um, currently it doesn't. So that was probably my biggest learning is the liability was actually the asset. Yes, and also I, I saw you started your uh, YouTube channel during that time. You were interviewing a lot of people and also you, st uh, you have started your, pol I think, po uh, party as well, political party. Am I right? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, um, well, the political party thing was, um, it was a piss take joke on April's Fools, but it, the backbone of it was actually around this idea of uh, why can't we have a, um, a, a better real-time voting system that was built on blockchain for New Zealand. So instead of a party basis, it was done on a per issue basis. And you could do that in real time from the people because I think it's become very clear, you know, you know, a good friend of mine, he's super green on one side, he's super left on the other side, then he's super capitalist on the other side. You know, that, the choosing red or blue doesn't, doesn't actually truly represent him. And so we just sort of talked about this idea and um, eventually it will happen. I just wanted to be historically correct for when it does. Mm. I can say that I actually put it out there, one of the first ones to put it out there first because I think the way um, voting and, and um, power will shift um, with the future of blockchain technology is going to be a thing and I just put that, had put that out. So, um, yeah, so that was that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and do you have a podcast as well? Uh, yeah, so I mean, what, the interviews and stuff that I did, um, I basically, when we were in level four lockdown, yeah. I think five weeks, I basically did five weeks straight interviews, nonstop. Yes. <laughs> and I, probably, I don't know, like a hundred or whatever, however many people, it was pretty crazy. I saw that. And the reason I did it was because, um, yeah, the reason I did it is because a lot of people were messaging me privately and they were struggling. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know um, where to go, what to do, what to talk about, whatever. And I kind of felt it was, it's kind of a stupid sort of thing, but in my head anyway, I felt it was like my duty if I had access to these people that were you know, influential and powerful and running companies and running these different things, why not figure out where all their headspace was at with how they can try and navigate this for others because there was no outlets for that. And so literally all it was was just a way for me to try and, I guess, leverage my contacts and Rolex, Rolodex of, um, of contacts for, you know, insights and education that can help a bunch of different Kiwis personally and professionally. And the feedback from it was pretty awesome because basically a bunch of people were stuck at home and then they could, like, were tuning into these shows and they were watching what I was doing and creating, and that was that was pretty awesome for me. So, um, yeah, uh, was it sponsored? No. Was it paid? No. Did I put hundreds of hours into it? Yes. Did it help a bunch of people? Yes. And I think for me that was kind of the point because I had a I had a skill set and an opportunity, um, but I also had a will to try and be able to help a bunch of people if I could, and that's that's exactly what I tried to do. And I do remember uh, listening to you uh, when uh, Waikato University launched their business hub, I guess, and you were one of you were there one of the speakers. And I have seen this a lot that you love supporting the youth. Do, 
so just want to know more about that why do you like why you're so much into you know supporting the youth of new zealand that is a big one for me and i will always go extremely out of my way constantly to try and help those crew because i think of it like um like breadcrumbs of positivity you know what are these little small little breadcrumbs i can leave around with these things that i do that that help either shift narrative or change the perception or, or make people question these things and why specifically for youth was because i remember when i was 15 years old and you know my dad's passed away and i'm living in adenui christchurch and we're on the sickness benefit i'm failing high school and i'm surrounded by gangs and drugs and bullshit and then your careers advisor tells you that you can go and work at a warehouse packing boxes nothing wrong against working in a warehouse packing boxes but i didn't want that to be the ceiling for me right and she said that this is what i could do and i used that as fuel to go and do it and then now that you know I don't look, I look around now and I'm 36 and, you know, it's been a pretty lonely journey for the last, you know, 10, 15 years trying to build these things that I've done because I've, you know, this, you know, one of my mentors was just like, you know, name five other people who look like you, roll like you, they've done what you've done, they talk like you, act like you, dress like you in your world, in your lane. And I can't name 10. I can't name five. I can hardly even name three. The point being, when you're the one that breaks down the door first, I feel it's your responsibility and obligation to knock more doors down for others because if I don't do those little things, someone like yourself or the next level or whatever, the, like I don't know if it will have an impact for years and years from now, but they might remember something that I said five or ten years ago in a room that I chose to come down to to do it for free, which changed the way they view things or challenged what they could potentially do or whatever, you know, and so um, it's basically i feel obligated to try and create those moments or experiences or opportunities for others because i didn't have that and i knew that if i didn't have it but i was look fortunate enough to get here i know that i'm the one percent of the one percent in the headspace because i'm a flipping nut job and i was going to go do it anyway but there are many who don't have enough bravery to try and do it so all i'm trying to think is okay well how can i try and you know encourage them to give it a crack and encourage them to give it a go so they don't wake up at 60 with with regret of stuff that they didn't do in the past so and i think that will always be there for me um especially at that that young age and so now i know like i i would wish there was a hundred of me or a thousand of me not like not like me me but i mean in terms of you know like young bucks coming into media and tech or creatives or whatever like you don't need to um uh, you know, go down those traditional pathways if you're not built for it and it's totally okay. And then if you are skilled and go down those pathways, why not think bigger to do more? Um, so for me, it's I just want to try and create more things that can potentially inspire others. Um, and I won't know the impact of that until years and years to come. And I think maybe that's the cool thing, right? Because um, I think everyone else is, not that they're not taken care of, but um, I don't see many kiwis in positions like i am really driving to those things that matter and i think it's right in that you that you spot on the come up because they're going to be the future ones that are going to be catching up to the current leaders way faster than um than i than they think is, is currently happening so that's that's why i do it yeah uh, i i got inspired as well because of your story to do more so you really act actually uh, affected me as well so just letting you know you're an inspiration for me as well and um i, I have I always thank you so much i've always seen you always talking about tall poppy syndrome can we discuss about it a little bit more please sure i mean the tall poppy syndrome in new zealand is something that was here before i was so i'm not trying to say it happened when when i was here um but it goes back deep to this kind of underlying thing of what is it about New Zealand society, particularly in Australia, but say New Zealand, that this is even a thing? Like, why is it that if you're, if you're good at something or you're proud of something that you can't be, you know, loud and proud about being confident about the thing that you're good at and celebrate a win? Why is it that when you're awesome at something, you're trying to hide in the bleachers and the backgrounds? Why is it that? And it's because those around you then pull, pull you know, pull that down and, 
you know, after um, I exited my businesses, I did a um, nationwide book tour. We went all through New Zealand from north to south, and it was it was amazing. I was just speaking to schools and stuff, and it was it was incredible. And I sort of would say it up, and I'd say, look, like you haven't heard of this thing now, but it's coming for you, and it's going to hit every single one of you by the time you become an adult. You know, we'd be in the rooms, and all the teachers would put their hand up when I said, do they know what tall poppy syndrome was? And none of the kids knew. And it was just this weird thing of like, what is it about society that um, this invisible thing is killing so many future dreams that all adults know about it, but no young kids do, which means that, you know, it's the older ones that are pushing it down on us. And so I just kind of like this idea of, you know, I think I think a lot of New Zealanders are going to have future regret for stuff they didn't do because they weren't brave enough. And all I'm trying to get out is just like, you know, if you can surround yourself with a small good crew who are supportive of you and your missions and your dreams, regardless if you win or win or lose, it's better to give it a crack than wake up at fifty or sixty gutted you didn't try. And so, I mean, I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to do that. But I, what I do know is, the more people that have more internal bravery, the more they'll go after their own stuff and basically stuff what anyone else thinks and go try and create and do. And I think that's that's what New Zealand needs more of because there's a lot of missed opportunity with business and ideas and products and services that don't get out the door because people are too scared to give it a go. Yeah, and I have seen uh, like now just a little bit wanted to talk about how's uh, fatherhood being been with for you. Pretty awesome. Um, before I had kids, I've this before you know I I wanted to become a billionaire and by the Oakland Raiders, right? And then I had my children, my two daughters, and the second I had daughter, I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. Because for me to do that, it would mean basically working for the next 50 years, 70, 80 hours a week, nonstop. And then the cost of that is, you don't know your kids, don't spend time at home, you're not with your family, you become distant, you do whatever. And that's just not a world that I, I want. I think the priorities for me is I'd rather have, you know, um, my daughters uh, pumped and stoked and good humans and a, and a small circle. And yes, I'll still do business stuff. And but you know, at the end of the day, like, would I do bigger things in business if I didn't have a wife and a family and kids? Hundred percent, because you'd just be a hundred and fifty percent into the business stuff, right? Like, yes. But would I miss out on all this other stuff that I've got now? Hundred percent. Now, am I willing to lose that? That personal side to win professionally? No, I'm not. No, not at all. So it's totally, um, it's made me sort of question time and bandwidth and and priorities of like, you know, what's really important, what's not. Like, do people actually give a shit or do they don't? Like, what actually is important? And I think what you realize is when you get stuck in older two is, you know, 99% of the stuff doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know? There's only, like what you thought was a big deal at 15 isn't a big deal at 20. What you thought was a big deal at 20 isn't a big deal at 25. What you thought a big deal was at 25 isn't a big deal at 30. And it just keeps going up, right? Because your perspective changes, you know? And I think that's one of the cool things that I guess I've, you know, I guess got to is, um, I, yeah, I, I, um, I've been able to prioritize a lot better of what is or isn't important. Um, and that's probably been one of the cool things. So, so, so how has it changed uh, me from a, from a work perspective is it's validated what I knew was true um, and then and then one of the best biggest blessings through COVID was you know I've been an insanely present um, father throughout it. and and I know that you know these formative years with with my daughters they're going to be look back and be super pumped for all, all that time and I think that's cool but a lot of people get that formula wrong and I'm not I don't know what the right or wrong answer is but everyone's got their own you know their own their own their own thing um, and so on as fortunate enough with their time and but for me I wanted to try and be um if I could I want to try and be you know present with my with my daughters and my and my family and that's what I've been able to do so it's changed me dramatically would probably be the simplest answer mm. anything that you want to share about your business with us anything that uh, changed or something that you innovated recently because I know you you are an innovative mind so you're coming up with something or the other new um, I've been thinking about a couple things recently um, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch I always think about 
um, you know, I'm still perplexed as to these are, like I said, a macro like some stuff that I think about. You know, why is it that um, any big brands and platforms haven't been able to monetize um, social media instead of their own platforms? You know, they they put content on their own their own platforms which are trying to monetize, but they they're not thinking of social media as a new TV network. That's interesting to me. Um, I think there's been a big wave in access to education to try and help a bunch of businesses, but there's clearly a disconnect because people aren't executing through. So I start wondering about like human behavior and communities with why people don't say yes to the help even though it's there for them. That's yep. been kind of on my mind a little bit. Um, the future of blockchain technology, where literally how it is will it will fundamentally disrupt every single person on the planet at some degree, at some point, very soon. And I don't know how this is going to play out. Um, tension on culture and commerce. Um, I'm seeing more and more, I'm seeing Māori Dim become super cool, which is awesome. But then I'm also seeing people trying to exploit culture without actually really supporting it back. So they're trying to take money from it, but not, not help within it, which is kind of frustrating for me. Um, I think... I've come up with this idea that, you know, by the time I'm dead, I'd like New Zealand to get named back to Aotearoa. I think that should happen mm -hmm. before 2100 was when I think I'm going to die because I was born in 1985. And if I die in 2100, it's 115. I think that seems like a good run. So I'd like Aotearoa to get reestablished by 2100. Um, in terms of um, investment and business stuff, it's become super clear that there is a massive gap around investment um, options for fast growing small businesses that aren't big enough for VC yet, but can't get funded by friends and families and the banks don't want to touch them this yet because they're probably too risky. So that's one of the things I'm looking into around like what would, um, you know, function um, a venture capital, a capital such private equity, um, you know, capital arm for small business in New Zealand look like? That's, that's interesting for me. And also at a macro, um, you know, like how can New Zealand try and take advantage in any way possible commercially for the actual opportunities that COVID provided. Um, and I think we probably haven't, it doesn't feel any way um, that we've done the best job in becoming a magnet for global commercial opportunities and opportunities uh, in, in New Zealand when basically the world was shut for a year, New Zealand was still rolling, but what did we build out of it globally? You know, people couldn't come in, but tech's our second biggest export. I don't know what the answer is, but it, feels like there was a lost opportunity for, for the tech sector to do something that became a magnet for um, for commerce and, and opportunity. So that's another little thing. And these are, you know, you, you go into politics and you, you think about, you know, like, why can't we have a system that's more real-time based voting that's prioritized on our needs that are hyper-localized to each different community? You know, how can one person decide what's good for a million people? You can't. What if a million dollars could get split across a million people evenly as voted by the people in real time? That feels like a smarter thing. And these things all happen in time. But these are just kind of some of the stuff that's that sort of bubbles away bubbles away in my in my head. And uh, in the end I would like to get five takeaways from Robert Hollis. Five takeaways. Yeah. Um, I always think about, you know. Don't be a dick. <laughs> Try to do good. Um, help others if you can. Be authentic to you. And, you know, my mum would say, you know, if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. But being authentic to you is a big one because so many people front who they're not, you know? Like, I know who I am. Hmm. I'm young, loud, uh, media, tech, rah-rah shit, like, cool. Like, I get that. Like, I, I know that about myself. I also know, you know, I'm extremely empathetic in situations. I'm over-emotional situations. I'm very, you know, but I'd rather, I constantly would rather have myself um, flat and know who I am and how I roll than fake something that I'm not. Um, and I've lost a lot of opportunity because I've been authentically me. But I don't have regret about it because I know that if I faked it for others and did, did stuff that wasn't true to me, I would then wake up with regret being pissed that I did those things. And I'd just rather, rather not have that. So my biggest fear is the future regret. And, and not many people can, can actually do that. And then the other one is probably, um, you know, being braver for braver conversations. 
you know, like try and have the actual conversation. You know, if there's shit going on there, instead of just like swiping on the road, like tr- like try and have the chat. Hey, I don't think this position's working out for you. It sucks. Hey, I can't afford this right now because I'm in debt. Hey, so and so's this relationship isn't working because whatever. Like those tougher conversations are very tough to have, and not many people have them. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like to push the bar a little bit of of that uh, that, that sort of un, that uncomfortable layer that that others have to do. And you know, like my energy now is a lot different to 26, which is a lot different to 16, which is a lot different to six, but I'm still the same person. Like I know I've been the same dude, regardless if I'm talking to you or a CEO or a homeless street kid or anyone, I know I am. And every single person who's ever interacted with me knows that same thing. And I think that's probably one of the coolest things I like is when you can be authentically new at, at you and have that consistency after so many years, every single day in and out, that actually speaks volume to, to character, I think, because love it or hate it, at least you've been consistent with who you are and represent. Many people aren't. Many people will change that. And so, you know, consistency and character is is one thing that I think um, I'd rather be hated for being me, truly me, than win being someone I'm not and hate myself. <laughs> And um, I also see you only wear black clothes, same t-shirt, same pants, everything. Why is that? Yep. Why is that? <laughs> so, yeah, it's super, um, the, there is a story. The story is when I was professional snowboarding, I got everything for free and everything was branded. After I stopped snowboarding professionally, I got rid of absolutely every logo because in my head it was like, if you're not pa- if you're not paying me, I'm not wearing your logo, you know, because I was the brand. They were paying me to rep their products, and so then all I had left was I had you know my wardrobe was all my sponsored gear, which all had branded logo on it, Oakland Raiders gear and blanks, and so I said, okay, well, I don't have any small sponsors anymore, so I'm going to get rid of all that, and I've just got two left. So I've either got Oakland Raiders gear or blank gear, and I can't really wear Oakland Raiders gear to like business meetings and shit, it's probably a bit disrespectful. So I've just got blank gear. And then my blank gear, I've got white shirts, gray shirts, black shirts. And then I'd bike to um, work because I live close to town and then I would sweat a bunch. So my white and grays would just sweat through and look like shit. I'm like, ah, oh, stuff it, I'll just wear black. And then if I sweat, it doesn't matter. Then when I get old and I get fat, it won't matter. Then it's the all blacks in New Zealand, so it looks cool. And you know, I was always, so I was like, sweet. So I just started wearing just all black just by default. And then I thought I'd be a bit more professional and wear a V-neck because then I was like, oh, well, if I wear a V-neck, then it feels a bit more businessy than I was just wearing a black T-shirt. So in the weekends, or well, when I get home and in the weekends, I wear usually a black T-shirt that is just regular. And then on Monday to Friday for my uniform, uniform, I wear a black V-neck. And it sounds super stupid, but it makes my life insanely easy because all my wardrobe is just like literally 20 black V-necks, 20 black regular ones. I just wear the same thing every day and I just don't even care. I just move on to the next. Now, now I collect shoes and whiskey, which is different, but in terms of day to day, um, that's literally just what I rock and rip. And it's just, I, plus I just don't really care. Like I'm not really materialistic. I don't really care about like fancy shit because for years in snowboard world, it was always like, have you got the latest this? Have you got those that? And like, since I stopped um, snowboarding professionally, like I still got, my last board, which I got for free, that I still ride almost 10 years later. And they've offered to give me free boards, the latest gear. I don't care. You know, like I went from literally riding the newest, I, I, I was riding next year's technology the year before because I was professional. And the second I've stopped, I've now got a 10 year old snowboard and I don't even care. <laughs> so, I think I'm just not built for, um, I'm not even, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basic. I'm extremely basic. I wear black, I talk shit, and I try to do good stuff. That's about it. I, I never thought, uh, I never have seen, seen you talking shit or hear anything like that. Whatever you say is, is it means a lot. Like, you know, I have understood everything that you have said. I still remember all your presentation, all your words, and, you know, that really inspires. It's not a small thing to, to be where you are today. So it means a lot. Thank you for every, everything and also giving us time 
may I please know for the audience where are you at the moment and what time it is? I'm in San Francisco with five hours ahead a day before. So you're on Friday and I'm on Thursday. So it's it's uh, early afternoon here now. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for giving your time. And is there any way we can actually do a giveaway from you for my audience? One giveaway. A giveaway? Yes. Oh, actually, oh, there's a, um, sure, you can go to rebet.com, R-O-B-E-T-G.com, and there is a free six-hour social media blueprint, which is a six-hour course of all my digital thinking to give away for free, which is how I got to 1.7 million people online for free without spending a single cent. So you can go, it's, a, it's called the um, social media blueprint, and it's totally free, and it will teach you how to get to 1.7 million people just using a smartphone with no budget, which is exactly what I did. And I'll show you how I did it. And it's free. Uh, 1.7 million on which, uh, which uh, 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 social media app? It was on Facebook and LinkedIn. Wow. <laughs> and you're, are you on uh, Instagram and uh, TikTok as well? I am on Instagram. I do not use it, okay. um, but I'll follow my friends and stuff, which I'll see. Um, but just LinkedIn's probably the best way to get me. LinkedIn or Rebet.com, R-O-B-E-T-T.com. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. It means a lot uh, talking to you. And uh, since I've met you, a lot has changed on my side too. But thank you so, so much for giving me the opportunity to interview you because this meant a lot to me because for me, you were always the big man. And I was like, I don't know if he's going to say yes and, and if he's going to say no or what. But honestly, it means a lot. Thank you so much for that. And I, I would hope that this... Uh, I was just going to say, it's been cool to see that um, your, your journey with you know, you're starting your companies and you're moving, you're learning, you're creating, you're trying. And whether you win or lose, it doesn't matter. The fact is you, you're trying, trying and you're giving the nudge and that takes a bit of bravery as well, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, it's cool that I can have a, you know, impact. And, you know, I just ask, you know, you'll do the same thing, hopefully, if you get to a, a you know, a bigger, better spot for the, for the next person. And you, you break that door down and then it becomes, you know, inspiration can become generational and people that try and change their lives for good, doing good stuff in business, whatever, like those things matter because then, you know, you will wake up at 50 years old and you won't have as much regret there as if you didn't do it and if you just went on the path of what was, right? And so that's true to yourself and you will only know that. And the same way I try to do it, you know, like I, if that happens for others, it's, that's even better. So it's been um, congratulations and props to you as well. Um, regardless where the, the trip ends up, you know, we, we all eat shit, we all fail, we all keep trying, we keep moving. But at the end of the day, I think when people know that your intent is right and you're trying genuinely, um, they give you a lot more leeway. So just, you know, keep the intent right, keep the momentum in the right way and um, yeah, just be prepared for a long, long, long game because this is definitely a marathon, not a sprint. But I really appreciate the time, it's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. And can you please ask my audience to uh, like, subscribe and comment? Sure, like, subscribe and comment. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> uh, you have a wonderful right, afternoon and uh, have a good day. See ya. Appreciate it. See ya. See ya.